It is my pleasure to welcome May Peng to Pop Goes the 60s. And hello, May. So good to see you again. I met you over the I summer know. on your uh, gallery tour. I, can you believe it? I mean, it's already um, more than half a year gone with all of this stuff that I seen you last. Uh, right. It's and you're the, the pop goes the 60. Of course, this is my favorite period of time. So, it's good. oh, very good. Well, I'm it's my favorite period of time, even though I, I was born in the 60s, but really came of age in the 70s and 80s. So, I just can't get off the 60s. Listen, I, I just love and I keep telling people my favorite period of time is between 50s and 70s, mm -hmm. you know, 50s, 60s, and they really shaped the rock and roll business. And, um, after that, it's, you know, it's revamping, constant revamping. You know, the 80s became the hair band. But again, you're taking songs. When you listen to all the commercials, we go back to the 50s and 60s with a lot of these songs that we're, because we're familiar with it. And to me, back then, lyrics matter. Nowadays, I don't know what they're saying, but the lyrics matter back then for me. You know, mm -hmm. when you listen to Carol King and Neil Sedaka, or you know, you know all the all the uh, uh, greats that that wrote those songs back then. You know, they meant something. Well, you've been very busy. In addition to the galleries that you've been visiting throughout all of last year, uh, you've got the new documentary that you're promoting, which is now available on streaming and on disc, and that is the Lost Weekend: A Love Story. And this right. is something a lot of people have been waiting for. This was in the works for how long? Well, you know, I started in 2017 when I approached uh, um, when I finally said. That's what I want to do. It was it started in 2017, and uh, we really finally brought it to the mass, the masses, as it were. You know that where people can actually go out and see it. We did a short run on, at the Tribeca Film Festival in, uh, in 2022, but really it was um, last year. I can't believe we're saying this in 2023, and it was 50. Can you imagine 50 years? 50 years ago, you know. It's hard to stuff. believe. But yeah. I think that it's a great companion piece to the couple of books that you've written. Uh, you've done two books on um, your experiences, plus the Instamatic Karma, which is not kind of a photo book. All of them are excellent. But this is really, this is video. And this is done by the directors were Eve Brandstein and uh, Stuart Samuels. And I was really And Richard Kaufman. He's Richard the actual, Kaufman. yeah, because he, he's the actual um visual because he that's what he you know he did a lot of the 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 cutting the idea the the you know all the stuff you know he he does he did the visual he he's amazing you know so along with the with the other two yeah for those of you who haven't seen it this is really a very well done piece and one of the thing i was really impressed with was all the archival footage of you and the lennons now did that come from your personal collection or how did you uh get your hands on that well the 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 video stuff uh was they obtained uh, the footage from from places uh which we licensed and uh a lot of the photographs um a lot of them came from my own collection and uh we, you know and one of them also came out of uh, from julian okay. so were there any issues with getting the licensing or the clearance for any of using any of that? Did you run into um, We really didn't have that big a, a problem. No. I'm very lucky. Good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> well, finally, I mean, you've always said that you didn't want somebody telling your story. So what, what about the story told in the past that most irritated you? I guess uh, <laughs> the most, I, I, I guess they, they didn't want to believe, mo a lot of uh, fans did not want to believe that I existed in John's life. And, um, you know, I hate the word mistress. You know, that means you're undercover. Uh, I wasn't undercover with John. I mean, John and I really were out in the open. Um, and we lived together. So, and we did not live together for just a weekend. <laughs> and that's one of the big myths of, of time. Um, it, it was just a phrase he used. He, you know, because people kept asking him about, oh, you were so drunk all the time. And and how do you feel about it? So he used he liked using metaphors of and back then it was movies. And he, you know, the the movie, of course, was also called The Lost Weekend. Uh, that was and so he just said, yeah, it was a long, it was a long lost weekend. So that's how it became that. And of course, John said to me, he goes, you know, they're going to think it's about us. And it wasn't about us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a lot of myths that goes out there. And I try to, um, you know, to let people know this is what actually happened. They weren't sitting in my shoes. 
every day was just a, a whole other thing. And, you know, and uh, we actually had a good time and John was not constantly drinking, which the press would love to always um, portray. Mm -hmm. And if he was, how could he do all the work that he did do? You know, it's like all the albums and all the work and hanging out with friends. And then the few times that it did happen and it blew up in the press, it's like they keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. So, and then of course it sounded like he was on the binge every day, of, you know, every day. And that's not what happened. Yeah, I was very, it was good to hear some, some of the myths that were told in the documentary. One of the things I didn't quite realize was how you didn't actually live in Los Angeles. You didn't really, you were visiting there. You, your residence was always maintained in New York. And right. you kept coming back. And that was one of the things that was interesting too, because it wasn't a, a, a constant party there. And John was the one that kind of had to get away from the party there. Cause you know, you see the photo photographs of some of the clubs and, you know, he was really not there most of the time. I know. And it, it, it was, uh, I know people like to put him in there, you know, you see him once and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, it's party time. John was always here. John was not always there. And the few times that he did, you know, it's like the boys hanging out. It wasn't like he wanted, he needed a drink. He didn't need a drink. He would go out if the boys are, you know, and I say the boys, I mean, like you're talking about Harry Nielsen, Ringo, and, and uh, you know, whoever else was around. If they wanted to go out, they just all went out together and, uh, and had fun, like the old days. But, you know, they, John would always get the, uh, he was a new kid on the block. And so he was always getting the, um, you know, people always looking out at him, you know, what he was doing. Yeah, I suppose they wanted to initiate him and to party with John Lennon. Who wouldn't want that? So, I mean, they always put the pedal to the metal. And uh, Mr. Nelson was probably the, uh, the chief instigator. There. I think uh, if anybody know, knew Harry back then, they knew that he was the chief instigator. I mean, we love him. I mean, there was nothing about him. He was so talented. But when every every time you go, oh, let's go out. Let's. I have ideas. It was like. You could see every girlfriend, every wife, everybody going, oh, no, what are we going to do? When, when are you coming back? How long is this this party going on? So, uh, you know, it was, it was always in that. And I was like, oh, my God, my head would spin. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the problems that you faced with this retelling of the history was John Lennon basically towing a party line after the whole 18 month period you guys were together that really didn't do you service or didn't really do you do your re relationship justice. And I, know. I always thought that was the shame. I mean, the shame of the whole thing, because that's what people ran with. And, you know, in my business, there's still a lot of fan, you know, John Lennon fanboys out there that reduce your involvement to just a naive young girl who got lucky. And, and they have no idea. And it was uh, just the, the situation, you know, and I tried to keep myself in the background. And I, you know, first off, uh, I was, I, you know, I did not make a living when I was living with John. And the only monies I would make was when I did do some work, when I contracted, you know, recording sessions. I was not a paid person, which people would love to, you know, some people would love to make it sound like that that's what it was. And it, it didn't happen that way. Um, and then, you know, it was, it was a whole, it was a whole different thing. And I, you know, I didn't have the money. I'm not, you know, I didn't have the media. I didn't have the, and I didn't care. I just wanted to just work. So I had a hard time finding a job at the end because mm -hmm. um, sort of blacklisted, even though, uh, but, you know, you do what you have to do to, mm -hmm. to, you know, to survive. And that I did. And you were blacklisted because one, the relationship with John ended. And when John ended that, he was right. at the end of a contract himself. So new record companies recording him. And if you worked at one of the record companies, they were nervous to, to hire you because they didn't want something to happen where they would say, well, May works there. So we don't want anything to do with that record company. Well, that's, yeah, because at that point, uh, which a lot of people didn't realize, that's when uh, Yoko decided to be the business person. Uh, she was, just so people understand, Yoko did not get involved in John's business or managed his life until much later. So it was after, it was actually after John and I had split and 
and uh, he went back to the Dakota that uh, she took over, you know, managing his life. Um, and yes, and so I continued on doing what I had to do to survive, you know, and and I was fine. I was not uh, I was not looking for any great shakes or I, you know, I walked away with nothing and that was it. But during those five years, which I'm sure you, which you learned was the fact that John was not completely um, happy. And, uh, you know, cause I, I would get phone calls from him. I would see him in the last five years. And, um, you know, he was, he was having a tough time in his, in his own, you know, in his own world. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I, I watched the video with my wife and um, she doesn't know about the Beatles as much, and she knows a little bit about them and about you. Cause I talk about it a lot. And uh, one of the things we noticed was how much through the entire, all the photos, all the film footage, how much you're always smiling and you were young, but I can understand why John Lennon was very attracted to that because you had, you were such a breath of fresh air and it seems the opposite of what he was getting Pulse 71 in his marriage. And I don't think there's any real secret about that. No, I, you know, my household, as I would say, the one that I shared with John was totally different. I, um, I had a more um, open door policy. So anybody who came to visit, um, they were, you know, unannounced, they were allowed to come in. I mean, that's the way it was, you know, even to this day, if somebody knocked on my door, I say, oh, go, oh, come on in. You don't need an appointment to come and say, can I see you today? You know, um, it, it it wasn't that type of thing. And and when we were back in New York in our new apartment, I mean, our first guest um, rang the doorbell and we thought, who could that be? Nobody knew that we had this apartment. And somehow when John went to answer the door, it was, uh, you know, the doorman said, you know, we have a Paul and Linda down here. Hmm. And he was like, what? <laughs> and, and he turned to me and he says, what should we do? I said, what do you mean? What should we do? Said, Had them come up. What else? Yeah. They're your friends. Well, and that's, you... what, that's what happened. And you really lived through the last period where John was actually active with friends, Paul, Linda, Mick Jagger, uh, David Bowie, um, a lot of big stars, but a lot of other people as well. And he was he was social during that period. Very social. He was not um, he was he was more open. Uh, and that brings me to the way for Julian. So he finally had a chance to be with his son and he was having a good time with him. And that was important. And he finally got together. Uh, and finally had closure with, with Cynthia, which he never had mm -hmm. since I, his breakup with her. Yeah. I think the, the part of the documentary I liked the best was uh, Julian's appearance and how, he, I mean, obviously he has always been a big supporter of yours and how you guys have remained close. I thought that was one of the best parts of the documentary. So we have a current day Julian talking on your behalf. True. I mean, I, I'm very grateful um that he was he he wanted to do this for me um and you know I, I think when the people who haven't seen the movie when they get a chance they'll see what it was um and it, it was lovely and you know Julian's mom Cynthia and I were very close so it was um you know for for me it was it was also that it was the family you know it was the family that that we could we could finally you know put it together you know? Yeah, you were really instrumental in helping John be at ease because it seemed like he was very nervous about dealing with Julian. He hadn't been talking to him or seen him in a few years, and you kind of made that okay for him. I wanted him, you know, it's it's important because he was at such an age at like 10 years old, um, 10, 10, 11, and he needed to see his father. He needed his father. He hadn't seen him in three years. So, um, I thought it was just really important. I know people think, um, why hadn't he seen him and all sorts of things. I think, uh, I answered part of that in the movie and I won't give it, give it away so people can see and, and see the reason. And so, you know, there, it was, there was a lot of factors to why this happened. And I'm not saying John isn't to blame. 
yeah, he had he had a lot to blame, but there was also a lot of outside influences that that occurred. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't completely him. Well, that's one of the things I've always admired about your work and your writing and in this documentary is that John isn't, um, he isn't whitewashed. And that's why your telling of the story has so much credibility. Well, you know what it is? How can you, it can't be all hunky dory and it can't all be um, one side. Oh yes, it's, he's great. He's wonderful. He had his moments and I had to deal with it. And I did. And he, as uh, and he was a person, and he's always he always used to say, he goes, I I I try to be better. And when people say, oh, they can't stand, he used to beat up people. He used to do that. Yes, and yet at the same time, we don't allow, meaning the public doesn't want to give him the uh, the the space for him to make the improvement of himself. You got to learn how to change, and he was trying all the time, and that was the most important key. Yeah, I think. One of the things I also wanted to mention is obviously you have some detractors because in this day and age, you know, you've got, you know, the John Lennon, the canonization of him that now extends to Yoko Ono in this politically correct world. And if you say anything negative about her, even if it's just an observation of fact, you will be called names, misogynist or racist. And this is really getting away from what actually happened. And one of the things I like about your work is you never came to this telling of your story with an ax to grind. It's told, I think, very balanced. And, you know, you say good things about Yoko as well, but it's not um, a woman scorned type of position that you take, which I think also gives you credibility. I think the, the you know, people have asked me, because you don't come in with bitterness. I said, what, what good is it going to do me? We're talking so many years. I don't want to have that um, angst in myself where I said, oh, what could have? What could have, should have happened stays in the past. It's already gone. I now have to look from the present to the future. And when you see your friends, when they're, when they're gone, you go, oh, my God, what, what am I doing? So you got to make yourself happy. If you're going to keep that in yourself, then it, you can never be happy. Um, I don't want that. I want to live every day to, to say I did the best that I could and not plot against anyone but to make myself happy. And that's an, that's an important part of life. You got to make yourself, and I, John and I used to talk about that. And so we lived each day to ha- for happiness and what we wanted to do, not something that somebody else told us, unless it was work, obviously. But, you know, I would take him, he said to me, I want to go on a, um, I, you know, I always wanted to see what New York is about. And I, so one morning I said, okay, I'm going to take you on a bus ride. And he looked at me and he goes, a bus ride? I said, in, in New York City? I said, yeah. So we got on a bus in in, uh, in the winter time, and there was hardly anybody. It was a weekend. And uh, he's looking out the window and he's looking at the streets as, as the bus is going by and there's nobody around, you know, and then now the buses begin to fill up as we're dry, as it's going along. And you start hearing the whispers and they go, is that John Lennon? Is that John Lennon on the bus? And he turns to me and he goes, it's the nose. They recognize the <laughs> nose. And I said, stop. And all of a sudden, finally, with all the whispering, you hear, hey, John, how are you doing? And he goes, fine. And he turned to me. He goes, I told you, I told you. And he goes, and he looked at me and he goes, time to get off. I mm-hmm. said, yes, now yeah. it's time to get off. So he enjoyed himself for that moment. I wanted to do something. He didn't like being in limos unless we were going somewhere. And I'll give you another example. We're, you know, we're um, in a going to to uh, to an event, and the and we were taking some other friends along. Uh, it was actually his um, his chief engineer Roy Sakala from the record plant, and uh, and his wife. And I said, so when the car came to pick us up the limo. I, he was pulling and he was getting in the back and I'm opening the door to the front with the with the driver. And he looks at me, he goes, where are you going? I said, I'm not going to sit in the back with a bunch of people and being crushed. I'll sit with the driver. You could sit in the back. It's okay. I don't need to be there. And he thought about it for a minute. And he goes, you're right. He goes, all right, move over. And the driver's now horrified at the fact that he's now has to, he's sitting and he's driving us in the front. 
and we picked mm -hmm. up everybody else and and it was just kind of funny so that's that's the way i would think i wasn't like i need to sit in the front with limos he didn't like it you know he didn't mm -hmm. like limos well i wanted to ask you another question because your relationship developed so much so that you guys were looking to to buy a house together right. and uh in that house I, do you ever drive by that house at all it's hard you can't get in there it's in the pri like it's it's in the back you know and then it's on this piece of land and it's it's hard to get it's it's hard to get in there um when we went you had to make an appointment and um from what i understand now that it's 50 years later um the land uh because it's sitting on a uh like a cliff we had so much land but it's eroded away so much over the years that when i know people who have uh, who are real estate people out there said it doesn't look like it's going to be long before that house gets put into the ocean oh wow and that would be sad but yeah and it's eroded a lot because there was so much land in between that we could see it but you know it was far enough and now it's it's we we're at the edge well i was always fascinated with part of the relationship at that point because not long after that things ended and there was a lot going on with you and i think and, and most of the my viewers understand how you got involved with John and how Yoko kind of set the whole thing up originally 18 months later. I think she pulled out a lot of the stops to get John back. One was um, using Paul McCartney and uh, she really, you know, I think maybe overplayed her hand. And, um, but nonetheless, you had 18 months and that period of time gave us all that music. Julian got reintroduced to John. And if you hadn't been there, a lot of, the, we wonder what would have become of that period. I know it's a, uh, it's a total thing. It really started when we were working on mind games and um, it's going to be quite interesting. Uh, I know that, uh, that the estate is putting out the, you know, uh, mind games for next, for this year, it's 2024. Mm -hmm. And it should have been last year because that's where the 50th, 50th anniversary, but they're making a big thing of it this year. So I don't know what happens when you do walls and bridges, which is this year. And that it was John's um, only number one hit single with a number one album uh, in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. So let's see where we go with that as well. So there's a lot of things. Um, you know, John loved the fact that we could talk about music and and it was we loved the same types of music. And whatever I didn't understand, he would he would enlighten me. I mean, it's like him trying to teach me how to play guitar. Can you imagine? I didn't have the fingers for it. So he's going, come on, I want to teach you. It's what my mother taught me. And I'm going, I don't think I could do this. And, you know, so he was trying to teach me, ain't that a shame mm. on the guitar? <laughs> so I say, I don't think so. So <laughs> I got a chance to play. Well, it was always, always interesting to, to find out some of the songs he had been working on with you transformed years later into something else. And again, you had to kind of he had to tell this party line and tell the story that wasn't really, really accurate. So those things have come out and I'm very happy that you're able to kind of set the record straight on some of those old myths. Yeah. There, there might be more. Oh, really? <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, I, that'll be, that'll be for future. Well, tell, yes, I guess if you, so you've got some future plans for us coming and you don't want to divulge that now. Oh no, can't, there's nothing I'm still working on. The one we have, so everything is still in up here in my head. Um, but the the stuff that I could fit in to the ninety minute movie, because I know people have said to me, "Oh, you know, I wish it was longer." It's ninety minutes. I know a lot of people couldn't believe it, but it's ninety minutes, and mm -hmm. we could fit as much as we could fit. Um, you don't want to overextend your hand. What if nobody liked the movie? That would have been an interesting, you know, little thing. That would have been a problem. So at 90 minutes, I think we, we did, we did good. And I, I thank Richard, Eve and Stuart for that. Well, not only do you have, you've got the documentary out, you've been doing this, this gallery, uh, these gallery openings with your photography yeah, and, and you have a, you, you also have a YouTube channel. I mean, you could, you could do a podcast. You, you could, you could fill podcast week after week. No problem with all the stories you have. I, I know. And guess what? So there's, so I do a little thing called, uh, did I ever tell you about the time? And I just put in little short clips about, because people ask me questions. Is it true? Did he do this? And the first one that I put out, I did three. 
uh, and I do it sporadically because it's when I'm on the road or when I got moment. I uh, the first one I did, everybody wanted to know who was in the other black bag when I was on with um, on Dick Cavett. And I actually tell you who it is. It's not uh, and what anybody thought. No one would really know who this guy is, um, but it is a guy, and uh, it's quite it's quite interesting. So uh, I finally tell the 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 answer, and you know, so they should just go onto my YouTube, the Maypang YouTube channel. Well, I will put the link below for that and a okay. link to all your other stuff as well, because you've got a lot going on. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you uh, gave me a little time today. I When I started my channel four years ago, my goal, if I ever got May Pang on my channel, I will have arrived. So <laughs> I have not arrived. Oh, so thank, so Listen, really I'm going to you. New Orleans uh, next week. Oh, I don't know when this is coming out, but I'm going to New Orleans. And to me, that's a, um, it comes full circle. Because uh, 49 years ago, and I'm just going to leave you with this story, 49 years ago, right around this time period, this is where uh, Paul and Linda came by and uh, was visiting us. And this is where he was telling us about, oh, we're doing a new album and we're going to go down to record it in New Orleans. And John says, oh, wow. So after they left, John's going, oh, I like New Orleans, you know, and all this. I like to go. And I've never been. And I, I remember uh, thinking, this may be interesting. So a few days later, um, John is sitting there playing, strumming his guitar. And I'm sitting on the ground working with, we lived in a very sort of minimalist type of an apartment, no, hardly any furniture. Uh, uh, our bed was our, our couch as well. <laughs> so, and because we left the, the small bedroom for Julian. So we're, I'm sitting there and I'm doing some work and he goes, hey, I got to ask you something. And I'm going, what? And, you know, my back is to him. And he goes, what would you think if I wrote with Paul again? And I just sort of sat up, spun my head around like the exorcist, you know. And I said, I think it'd be great. And he goes, why? And then I said, well, you know, the two of you solo are good. But when the two of you write together, no one can beat you on that. And he goes, Hmm. Okay. That's all he said to me. Now, this just happened after the contract of the dissolution of the Beatles had been signed. So that freed up their, you know, whatever they could do, whatever they want, you know? So it was one of those. So when the one, of, so at the apartment on all of a sudden, um, Yokoi called, um, it was towards the end of the, the, a couple of weeks later, and he was like, oh, um, Yoko said, I have a great method to help you quit smoking. You got to come over today. And I didn't really want him to go. And he saw that I was hemming and hawing about it. He goes, listen, I'll be back. It'll be great. And let's make the plans. Let's book those tickets and let's go down to New Orleans. I said, OK. I knew if I got him down there, it would have been a John and Paul scenario going. Mm -hmm. um, he was ready. And I knew Paul would be ready, of course. So um, obviously it didn't happen. Uh, uh, years later, um, 1988, 89, I think um, I was I was at um, I was in London, and I was uh, with Tony Visconti, who of course later was my husband. Um, and he had done, a lot of people don't know that Tony had also did all the work, uh, all the orchestral arrangements for Ban on the Run. Anyway, we were invited to something and I, I saw Paul and Linda and Linda was, was uh, greeted me very warmly. And I said, uh, how's everything? And I turned around and I said to her, listen, I gotta tell you this. Um, you could tell this to Paul. I said, you know, John and I really were gonna come down to see you in, in New Orleans many years ago when you came by for a visit. And I was telling her the story and she said, I want you to tell that to Paul. I said, no, 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 you can tell. I don't, don't need to say, you know, it's just something I, I just thought I'd mention it. And she dragged me over to see Paul and I told him and Paul, of course, said, sure, sure. You know, did one of those. Uh, yeah. Thank you for letting me know type of thing. And I said, okay. 
And I, I thought nothing of it. A year later, he comes to New York and uh, they're in New York for the Buddy Holly session uh, for, you know, party that they would do yearly. Mm -hmm. It was the first one in New York. And they came in and I saw them and they came running over. And <laughs> I remember Paul going, Lynn, did you tell her? She goes, how could I have told her? I just got here the same night as you. So I said, tell me what? And they go, you know that Derek Taylor always uh, had things and he would sell things. He goes, we got one of his postcards and it was a postcard from, from John to, to Derek, but in it said, thinking of visiting the Max down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And that was the, you know, the needle in the haystack finding like what I told him was true. Mm -hmm. Confirmation. I mean, how, I, I mean, really years later, I mean, who would have thought and, you know, and, and Paul saw that and now thing that I said was was what I had said was true. Well, I think that mattered to Paul because Paul lost him twice, really, you know, and, um, you know. Now to all of a sudden see what I said to him, you know, I mean, what I what I said to him, and you know, early on, he could have said, yeah, OK, I could have made it up. I could have whatever. But to actually see a note that John actually said. To Derek, well, thinking of visiting the Max down in New Orleans. Well, the that written, just, that just yeah, made it. Yes, the written word is very powerful, isn't it? Yeah. So there. Well, that and a lot of other anecdotes are in the documentary. And I've noticed that I've got your first book here. And that's the original. That's really the the the, the first one that started it all. And I'm hoping that these get republished or, or redone because I know they're getting harder to find. And what, yes. since since the documentary came out, these have skyrocketed in price. Oh, really? I you know, yeah. I don't think I'm going to put it back out. It's mm -hmm. only because it's just it takes so much time and effort, and um, and besides the movie, that's why we did the vi the movie because the visuals become the 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 thing. Most people don't read unfortunately and the visuals what they they see more now yeah we look how long it took world. me to do the visual <laughs> yeah it's easier for me to do a video than for me to write something that's for darn sure yeah and that's exactly it so um so i'm just glad that my my documentary's out well i love it it's called the lost weekend love story and available on streaming and on disc i'll put some links below Great. And, and May, thank you so much for your generous uh, time here today. I know how in, in demand you are. And my my audience will be very grateful that you took some time to share with us. Thank you. Um, you know, they could always uh, find out where I am. Uh, they can go on my Facebook page or uh, rockartshow.com is another place because uh, that's um, I work with this guy, uh, Scott Siegelbaum, and, and he posts wherever we're going to be going next. And like I said, it's full circle for me now because my next stop is New Orleans. And it will be 49 years ago where we were supposed to be going. And, there, and here I am going. Well, I wish I could join you. That's also one of my favorite towns. I've never been. So this is going to be perfect. Mm. I'm bringing John now oh, to New great. Orleans. You're going to love the little streetcars and the French Quarter and... Oh, you love it. Sounds great. I can't wait. Well, have a great time and uh, hopefully we could do this again someday. You got it. Absolutely. Thank you. I enjoyed this. My pleasure, May.